As the Mongols were reaching the height of their power, a new and different era was emerging in the Italian peninsula. This shift can ultimately be seen as the product of centuries of interactions, but as its ideas and philosophies spread throughout Europe, it sparks an entirely new age. In today's lesson, we'll focus on the historical context and influences of the European Renaissance. The term Mediterranean Basin refers to the geographic region centered around the Mediterranean Sea, and it includes parts of Europe, Asia, and Africa. For much of global history, the Mediterranean Basin was ever-changing, but as you know from prior lessons, Europe between 1200 and 1450 was in many ways a study of continuities. The same systems which had ruled social and economic structures since about 1000 CE, feudalism and manorialism, were still in use centuries later. Religious belief heavily influenced individuals and culture. Almost everyone in Europe was Christian, and the homogeneity, the relative sameness of Europeans, was a hallmark of European history at this time. And yet, Europeans, especially those living and working along the Mediterranean basin, had significant interactions with people of other cultures, and these interactions did begin to influence Europe's practices. For instance, in the late 1000s, European Christians had begun a military effort to push back Muslims who were, at that time, threatening the great Christian empire in the East, the Byzantine Empire. Now, Islam had spread widely throughout the Middle East and North Africa prior to this time. You can see that on the map. In the late 7th and in the 8th centuries, Islam had spread all across the Mediterranean basin, even making it into Spain, where Muslim established a state, Al-Andalus. This new military effort on the part of the European Christians would itself span multiple centuries and would come to be known as the Crusades. The first four major crusades took place between 1096 and 1204, and there were numerous small crusades which also occurred within that time and after it. For the most part, the crusades pitted European Christians who were attacking mostly Muslim people living in lands along the Eastern Mediterranean, which were considered sacred to both Christians and Muslims, as well as to Jews. This European attempt to retake the Holy Land failed miserably, and in the end, Muslim governments retained control over the entire area. However, these centuries of warfare did expose European crusaders to products, foods and luxury goods, as well as to ideas that originated in the Muslim world or further east, in South or East Asia. In the Middle East, central marketplaces called souks or bazaars were often completely enclosed, with storefronts opening into covered central walkways, a very different experience from shopping in Europe. Regular movement along the Silk Road brought luxuries like silk cloth, porcelain, jewels, and spices. When the individual crusades ended, soldiers who'd been exposed to these goods still wanted access to them. And so merchants in the Mediterranean, mostly Italian merchants, expanded their trade connections with the Middle East in an effort to access these goods and sell them across Europe and get rich in the meantime. European merchants based around the Mediterranean also took advantage of North African trade routes. North Africa was one of those regions largely converted to Islam in the 8th century, and the Islamic peoples of West Africa, like in the Mali Empire ruled by Mansa Musa, were connected to the rest of the Muslim world via the Trans-Saharan trade routes, which crisscrossed Africa's great northern desert. Merchants traversed these routes by camel caravan, bringing goods from Eurasia to Africa and trading West Africa's greatest natural resources, salt and gold, both westward toward Asia and northward towards the Mediterranean basin. Because these natural resources were in such high demand, the Trans-Saharan routes were sometimes called the gold-salt trade routes. It was Italian merchants who took the greatest advantage of these new business practices and these connections both with Muslim merchants in Africa as well as in Asia. Even throughout the Middle Ages, Italy had been different from the rest of Europe. While one kingdom occupied the southern half of the peninsula, the rest of Italy had divided up into a number of competing city-states. In Europe, cities were able to retain independence from the nobility through the use of town charters, an agreement between the city's government and the noble on whose land the city existed. 
In exchange for paying what amounts to rent, the city was able to govern itself, free from noble intervention. While not always free of all noble interference, for the most part, the inhabitants of cities elected their own officials, they wrote their own laws, they even had their own armies and defended themselves against enemies. Over time, the strongest of these Italian cities, cities like Florence, Venice, Pisa, Milan, and Genoa, became city-states, and they grew so strong that they were entirely independent from nobles or feudal states for long stretches of time. These city-states established themselves as republics. Two of them, Venice and Genoa, remained independent republics until the end of the 18th century. Like in other cities across Europe, the inhabitants of the Italian city-states existed outside of the manorial and feudal systems. They lived somewhere in the middle, the origins of the idea of a middle class, and they were largely engaged in occupations ranging from manufacturing to trade. It's true that these city-states still had lots of inhabitants working in food production. Acquiring land that could produce ample food for a city's population is one reason why these city-states expanded, but those living within the city walls were bakers and weavers, merchants and bankers. Here, the amount of money you had, your monetary wealth, translated into political influence. Craftspeople banded together to form guilds. These organizations helped maintain quality control for the products manufactured by its members. They set prices for products and sometimes dictated on which days of the week individual members could sell their merchandise. Guilds established their own educational systems to train children, apprentices, in the crafts. Guilds also helped maintain roads and bridges within the city, and they helped to maintain portions of the city walls as well. Guild leaders, the guild masters, were often part of the city government. In most of the Italian city-states, the most powerful guild was that of the bankers. Originally, bankers worked to exchange coins from one region for the currency of that in another region. Most European exchange rates were based on the Florentine coin, the florin, the most stable European currency of this time. Florence's largest bank was run by the Medici family, the family who also came to dominate Florence's government in the 14th and 15th centuries. Eventually, bankers also safeguarded people's monetary wealth, and they provided loans to businessmen, often to merchants, seeking to finance voyages for trade. Bankers made their money by requiring loanees to purchase insurance on their voyages, which the bank kept whether or not the voyage was successful, or by requiring that merchants return a portion of the profit to the bank for providing the funds in the first place. European bankers also borrowed ideas about streamlining banking practices from Asia. In China and in the Middle East, beginning around the 8th century, prototypes for bills of exchange grew in popularity. A bill of exchange is a document through which one person can give money to another person by instructing their bank to make the exchange. The payee, the person to whom the money is being transferred, can take that document, that bill of exchange, to the bank, and they can receive money in return. These basically are checks. A bills of exchange made commercial transactions much easier. Rather than having to carry around lots of coins or paper money, which could be lost or stolen, Merchants could just write a bill of exchange when purchasing goods. Bills of exchange weren't the only ideas coming to Europe from Asia. Perhaps more importantly, Europeans were re-exposed to Greek and Roman texts that they thought were lost. Muslim philosophers and writers had painstakingly translated these texts into Arabic during the translation movement of the 8th through 10th centuries. The movement known as the House of Wisdom was critical in maintaining these ideas. While these translated and preserved texts had been available to people in the Byzantine Empire and in Al-Andalus, remember that's Muslim Spain, during this time, and after the development of trading ties during the Crusades in the 12th and 13th centuries, these texts were increasingly available to other Europeans as well. Greek and Roman texts on philosophy, astronomy, and medicine, as well as scientific and mathematical texts by Muslim authors, helped spread new ideas in Italy and beyond to the rest of Europe. The rediscovery of Greek and Roman ideas led some Italian scholars to rethink their time and place in history. One such scholar was Petrarch, who lived in the 14th century. 
Petrarch was born in Italy, but raised in both Italy and France. He worked for the church during the Avignon papacy and notoriously wrote about how he hated working in Avignon, which he called the Babylon of the West. Petrarch's study of Roman authors and of Cicero in particular led him to champion a new idea for self-improvement and education. This idea, fostered by Petrarch and others who thought similarly, came to be known as humanism. Renaissance humanism as a philosophy sought to reapply classical Greek and Roman values on the European continent. Those values included a particular educational focus on what they called the humanities, grammar, rhetoric, history, poetry, and moral philosophy. At the same time, the earliest humanists, many of them clergy members, likely also sought to reinvigorate the Christian church by urging a return to original Christianity, Christianity uncorrupted by more modern concerns. Well, how did you do that? You read the oldest texts in their original languages. You studied. The goal of most humanists was to create a citizenry that was well-educated enough to propel their entire population forward. This could be accomplished if every individual worked to become the best version of themselves possible. So, humanism emphasized education and individualism, a focus on the individual, so as to create the best state possible. Humanists encouraged the publication of and collection of books, they expanded universities and their curricula, and they encouraged personal endeavor and dedication. They encouraged a rebirth, a renaissance of Europe into a new age. Of course, the Italian Renaissance got off to a horrible start thanks to a pandemic known as the Black Death. This disease caused by the bacterium Pastorella pestis spread quickly throughout Afro-Eurasia via trade routes. It originated in China, the beginning of the 14th century, then traveled to South and Southeast Asia by land and sea routes. It hit the Middle East as the Mongols were continuing to expand westward into Europe. Italian merchants traveling in Mongol-controlled areas brought the disease back to Europe in the late 1340s. It would stick around Europe for several years. The Black Death most usually manifested as swellings that turned black when they putrefied. The disease spread so quickly that quarantine measures were largely ineffective in curbing the spread. It was particularly harmful in urban areas where people were packed closely together. Some Italian city-states lost as many as 50% of their population. Other, less densely populated places in Europe were hardly affected at all. In total, historians believe that maybe as much as one-third of Europe's entire population died during this pandemic something like 25 million people. The Black Death itself was a perfect storm. Physicians around Afro-Eurasia weren't sure how to treat the disease. Even today, this disease is almost always fatal if it isn't diagnosed immediately. Religious leaders urged prayer and patience, but that was cold comfort to people who were sick or who'd lost their entire families to this plague. States were also unable to provide any real support. Most people who could afford to stockpiled food and isolated themselves from others in an effort to remain healthy. The experience of the plague shifted some cultural norms in Europe. Europeans in the future would rely a little less on the church and its clergy and rely a little more on themselves. They began celebrating the present more fully, living in the moment, because they realized that the future was not guaranteed. And this pandemic was, perhaps, one reason why humanism was able to take hold so quickly across Europe. In the aftermath of such misery, people seemed almost desperate to focus on the beautiful, the optimistic, the here and now. Humanism provided a good avenue for that. It celebrated the individual and, in refocusing on Greek and Roman values, humanists inspired artists to do the same. These artists began to study the human form more closely so that they could recreate it more carefully in painting and sculpture, more faithfully recreating what the Greeks and Romans had done centuries earlier. These Renaissance artists also perfected techniques such as geometric perspective so that their art looked more realistic than it had since classical times. 
This new genre of art is often referred to as Renaissance realism, and it includes works such as Donatello's David, Botticelli's The Birth of Venus, and Raphael's The School of Athens. In order for these artists to create such gorgeous works, and in such great quantities, these artists needed both time and money so they could focus on their art. So, who was paying them to draw all day? One of the, one of the hallmarks of the Italian, of the Italian Renaissance, Renaissance is, art is art patronage. Wealthy individuals, Wealthy individuals living, living in the Italian, in the Italian city states showed off their wealth off through their conspicuous, wealth through consumption. conspicuous consumption. They commissioned works of they art which horrified their, their families and their family histories, and, their family and they histories. supported artists, and they provided salaries for artists, painters, provided salaries, salaries for musicians and writers as a way to showcase their great wealth. In exchange, these artists often dedicated their works to their patrons, or they used their patrons' family as models in their works. It was a pretty good relationship. In fact, it was a symbiotic relationship in many ways. These artists were becoming the best version of themselves, the best artist that they could possibly be, and so they were living up to humanist values while being paid to do so by their patrons. Their art decorated the great homes in their hometowns, and in this way, they contributed to the progression of their state. Italy's city-states competed with one another in grandeur and in prestige. Even Rome, where the popes lived, jumped in on this action, patronizing architects and artists who renovated and decorated the buildings which comprised the papal court. The buildings you see in today's Vatican City? Those were mostly built during the Renaissance. While the Renaissance began in Italy around 1300, it was slow to spread to the rest of Europe. Part of the reason for this slow spread was the Black Death, but much of it was due to the Hundred Years' War. It's hard to focus on new philosophies when the two biggest states in Western Europe are at war for a century. Well, by the time the Hundred Years' War ended in 1453, Europe's long-standing social structures, manorialism and feudalism, were starting to unravel as well. That gave humanism an in in Northern Europe. Without continuous warfare, urban areas across northern Europe could expand just like Italy's city-states had done in the 1300s, and the bustling trade which had characterized the Mediterranean Basin region for centuries could begin to more directly influence commercial connections further north. Moreover, wealthy urbanites and nobles could in turn become patrons for northern European artists, leading to an extension of the Renaissance realism movement begun in Italy. The Renaissance's shift to northern Europe coincided with the development of the European printing press in the 1440s, which made the publication of books cheaper, which in turn brought down the price of books. Cheaper books meant more people had access to books, and this generally means that literacy rates rise. Well, one of the reasons that literacy rates rose was that writers began to publish works in vernacular languages. Vernacular languages were regular spoken languages, not academic languages like Latin. Florence's Giovanni Machiavelli wrote his The Prince in Italian, not in Latin. Spain's Miguel de Cervantes, whose book Don Quixote de la Mancha is often considered the first modern novel, wrote that story in Spanish, not Latin. England's great Renaissance writer, who obviously wrote in Elizabethan English, is arguably William Shakespeare, whose many poems and plays were performed for both noble and everyday audiences. 1453 wasn't only an auspicious year because it marked the end of the Hundred Years' War and thus the easier expansion of the Renaissance northward, it was also an auspicious year because that's the year that Europe's only true empire, the Byzantine Empire, was conquered. The Byzantine Empire had existed for nearly a thousand years. It was the part of the Roman Empire that didn't collapse in 476 CE. Since the early 7th century, it had been in very slow decline, as various Muslim groups, Arabs from the east, then Turks from Anatolia, had begun chipping away at its borders. By the time the Renaissance started in Italy around 1300, the Byzantine Empire was just a shadow of its former glory. Look on the map. Can you find the Byzantine Empire? Here's a hint. It's in pink. In the 14th century, a new Turkic group, the Ottomans, had begun to establish an empire in Western Asia. 
they crossed into Europe and they conquered the Balkans, thus threatening Constantinople, the capital city of the Byzantine Empire. In the middle of the 15th century, the new Ottoman leader, Sultan Mehmet II, decided the time had come to defeat the last remaining vestige of the Byzantine Empire, the fortified city of Constantinople, which he wanted to make the capital of his new empire. The city of Constantinople had fortifications built over centuries, two foot thick walls, chains which stretched beneath the waters of the Golden Horn and ripped into any ships that tried to sail past without permission. Sailors protecting the city walls used Greek fire, an incendiary chemical which the Byzantines aimed at enemy ships using a prototype of a flamethrower to end sieges quickly. But when the Ottomans came knocking in 1453, none of these fortifications ultimately held up. The Byzantine emperor had a paltry army of about 10,000 men, and he faced Mehmet's much larger army of more than 100,000. Using a bit of ingenuity as well as manpower, the Ottomans conquered Constantinople and eventually renamed the city Istanbul. The connections between the cultures and states of Europe, Asia, and Africa were fostered by the commercial ties afforded by the geography of the Mediterranean basin. Europe, Middle Eastern, and African ships sailed the waters of that sea while merchants traveled the routes connected to it the Trans-Saharan routes in Africa and the Silk Road in Asia. Of course, when the balance of power shifts in a region, that also affects trade. The rise of the Ottoman Empire in the Eastern Mediterranean after 1453 meant that European merchants had to forge new trade ties with a new Muslim state, or they had to find other ways to access the luxury goods from Asia to which they'd become accustomed. Which option would they pick, do you think? That's a story for a different lesson.